آسنا فاطمه أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Tonight marks the remembrance of Ali al-Akbar. Alayhi Abu al-Salatu wa-Salam, son of Imam Hussein, son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And when we look at such a figure in history, we can analyze him in different levels. But the most, one of the most important analogies is the analogy that we can look at him in reference to his father, Imam Hussein ibn Ali. And we find that the topic of a father-son relationship proves to be of the utmost importance throughout history. When someone is to look at the school of Ahlul Bayt, someone may come forth and ask, what's the relation that a man should have with his father? And vice versa, what's the relation that the father should have with the son? What are the rights? And what do you have from a hadith that we have to come forth and put in place when looking at these relationships? We're going to look at the relationship between the father and son in a number of stages. First and foremost, we'd like to look at the name and the wording from the Holy Quran and is there any examples? Secondly, what are the rights that the father has on the son? Thirdly, we'd like to look at what rights the son has upon the father. In history, we'd like to look at, at the fourth in the fourth step, we'd like to look at what people in history did not have a father and what effect it had on history. And inshallah we will conclude by looking at Ali ibn al Hussein's life. To start, please raise your voices in a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The word used to describe a father and the word used to describe the son in the Quran cannot be described or defined in the English language. Because when we look at it from a Quranic point of view, as an example, when Ismail talks to his father, he says, Ya Abati. Now we're looking at the word Ya Abati the definition in English would be, O oh Father. Whereas if we look at it from an Arabic perspective, in linguistics it has a tone of kindness. It has a tone of affection when talking to the Father. So it cannot be described. When we look on the reverse side, we look at the Father talking to the Son. Ya Bunei. Again, we can see a sense of kindness, a sense of affection in the word in itself. We have stories in the Quran which we mentioned a couple of nights ago. When you look at Luqman taking his son and in the mannerisms in which he taught him the different types of people. We look in the Quran and we see the example of Ismail and Nabi Allah Ibrahim and how he treated him. And when he told him about the dream, how he committed to the religion of Allah, he says, Father, if that is what God has prescribed, then by all means, sacrifice me. We look at the relationship that maybe Yusuf had with his father. 
and in which he cried and cried until three times he went blind. We look at these relationships and on the reverse angle, we would look at the relationship that Nabi Allah Nuh had with his son. We look at why he turned out the way he did. Now we're looking at what the father has to do to maintain a son in the religion of Islam and how to go about his relationships with his son. First and foremost, he has to cultivate his heart. In letter 31 in Nahjul Bala, Imam Ali alayhi salam talks to his son Imam Hassan and he tells him, my son, I try to cultivate your heart at a young age because once you grow old, your heart, your heart will harden and there is no room for cultivation. When you are young, I try to teach you. I try to teach you what the Prophet taught me. It's like, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, it's like a garden. A fresh garden ready to plant on. Whatever you throw upon that garden, that heart accepts. That's the analogy that Ali ibn Abi Talib puts. He says, whatever you throw, in that heart it would accept. Prior to it hardening. He says, that's what I try to prescribe and do towards you, O Hassan. So in that idea, that's first and foremost, at a young age, when the hadith says, when teaching your sons, teach them in three stages until the age of 21. He says the first seven years of a child's life, you should leave them be. Let them do whatever they want. Let their imaginations run wild. Let them be adventurous. Just stop them from killing themselves, basically. Otherwise, you let them do whatever they want. In the second seven years of their life, from seven to 14, he says, teach them and teach them. This is right. This is wrong. This is halal. This is haram. And not just the dot points, brothers and sisters. When he says this, he says this. When you teach them, you teach them with meaning. When you teach the woman, you would teach them you wear a hijab because this is why you wear the hijab. This is why Sayyida Fatima wore the hijab. This is why Sayyida Zainab wore the hijab. This is how Sayyida Zainab and Sayyida Fatima upheld the hijab. Not just give them the dots. You have to do this, you have to do this. Rather teach them why, so it can sink into their brain and they have a better understanding. Therefore, they will hold tight to what they have learned. So he says the second seven is you teaching them right from wrong, halal from haram. He says the final seven years of their life is the most important. Why? Because he says the final seven you have to befriend them. The final seven you have to befriend them. From the age of 14 to 21 be their best friend. Because other than you they might seek refuge in someone that does not have the best mannerisms. Someone they will have a shoulder to lean on that's not the best of people. And you find he will take them away from the path. Whereas if you are their best friend, you know what they need. They will come to you first and foremost for aid, for advice, for anything that comes in a way, for any trial and tribulations, you will be the first they will come to. And that's why it's a vital time in their life, brothers and sisters. A very vital time in their life when in the 23rd Treaty of Rights, Imam Zain al-Abidur writes, in the 23rd Treaty he mentions the right of your father. He says you have to know that the right of your father, that you know that he is your root and you are his branch. So the root of your blessing is who? Is your father, you are but a branch. When someone was to come forth that does not know who his father is. As an example in history, we find Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As, the beautiful and ironic story about Amr ibn al-As is that his father is not us. 
He's just met this, mentioned that in history. When Ali ibn Abi Talib would ever come in combat with Amr ibn al-As, he'd call him by his mother's name. Never did Ali ibn Abi Talib say Amr ibn al-As. He'd call him Amr ibn al-Nabigah. His mother was known as al-Nabigah. Her real name was Layla. And her nickname was Anabigh. Never did Ali ibn Abi Talib call him by Amr ibn As because As was not his father. In narrations, when we look at Surah Al Kawtha, Inna Shani'aka Huwal Abta, the one that shall not have descendants, or that shall not have a bloodline, that person was an As. Now if the Qur'an states about someone that you should not have a lineage, then you find someone in history called Amr ibn al-As. His name was chosen out of literally a hat, a lottery. His mother wasn't the most decent of women. When she had, an, when she had Amr, they did not know who his father was. One day they said, well, the men that you've been with, name them, we'll put them in the hat and we'll draw a name. That name would come to who? An ass. So they called him Amr ibn al-As. These are the figures in history, brothers and sisters. And look what later on they did. Look what kind of oppression they put to Ahl al-Bayt. These are the kind of figures that you have to look out for in history. Who else did not have a father? We look at Zayd. Zayd in history, they did not, they were confused. They didn't even look to put his name out of a hat. When Aisha was writing a letter to Zayd, she's thinking to herself, should I write Zayd ibn Abba Sufyan? And then she rubs it out. Then she said, should I write Zayd ibn Abi? And she rubs it out. When she sends the letter, she writes Zayd, and that is all. And when you find Zayd, got the letter, he starts laughing hysterically and they say what is it she said Aisha had a lot of trouble writing this letter because she did not know who I was the son of and you find another story in which Mukhtar comes forth and collects the people after Ashura amongst the people that he judged were the ten horse riders that trampled on the body of Abba Abdullah he asked each and every one of those ten horse riders that trampled on the body of Abba Abdullah who their fathers were. None of which could answer. None of them knew who their fathers were. They were illegitimate children. To give you an understanding of who opposes the message of Islam. So Imam Zayn al-Abideen in the treaties of rights the Treaty of Rights number 23, he mentions that the father is the root and you are but a branch. And he says, if you are to see something that you like about yourself, anything, a particular act, a particular moral, a particular act of kindness, anything in yourself, he says, know that the root of that blessing is your father. The root of the blessing is your father. Do that. He says, how should you treat your fathers? What rights should you treat your fathers with? I'll get to that in a second. Amongst the other uh, things that the father has to do towards his child is give him a good name. Give him a good name. You see in Arabian times, People would name the most atrocious of names. Atrocious names. He says, give him a good name. That's one of the rights. Another is to choose a good mother for his child. Choosing a good mother for his child. This is of the utmost importance. The Prophet comes forth and states, he says, a person chooses a spouse based on four. If you choose three, Allah will take all three away. Whereas if you choose the final one, He will give you all four. What are they? He says a person might choose a spouse based on beauty. 
Number one. Number two, he chooses a spouse based on wealth. The bank balance. Number two. He says, number three, the bloodline. A royal bloodline, that's a number three. Number four, based on religiosity. The prophet says, if you choose your spouse based on beauty, that beauty will diminish. For Allah will make her not beautiful in your eyes. If that's the basis of your choice. Second, he says, if you choose her for her wealth, or choose him for his wealth, that wealth will diminish. Or will not have barakah in it. So you lose that as well. He says, if you choose a spouse based on royalty, he says, your lineage will be that lineage that will be looked down upon. That's lineage. He says, whereas if you choose a spouse based on religiosity, he says, I guarantee you that Allah will give you rizq, sustenance, wealth. Secondly, he will make the spouse beautiful in your eyes. He says, third, he will give you a lineage that is pure. He says, if you choose for that sake, he will give you all four. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So what are the rights that the child should show towards his father? Amongst many Zain al-Abideen put four into place. He says, number one, in a gathering when your father enters, he says, you stand up for him and you do not sit down until he is seated. That's number one. Stand up for your father when he enters the room out of respect and do not sit down until he is seated. Number two, he says, do not walk in front of your father. Always walk behind him. Respect. He says, thirdly, and this is an important aspect, brothers and sisters, he says, do not do any action that will put the reputation of your father in jeopardy. Do not think that no one can see me, I shall do such an act. Or anything that shall put your father's reputation in jeopardy. Any act, brothers and sisters, whether it be of the great sins or whether it be of the small sins. Imam Zain al-Abidin says what? He says, do not look at the size or the magnanimous nature of this sin. Rather look at who you are sinning against. Imam Zain al-Abidin. Do not put your father's reputation in jeopardy. That's what Zayla teaches us, teaches brothers and sisters. Now, if we were to take this and put it into perspective nowadays, we ask ourselves, I ask myself first and foremost, do I do this on a daily basis? Do I show this respect that Zayla Abidin showed to his father? Do I show this respect that Imam Hussein showed to Imam Ali alayhi salam. That's the idea of respect that the Ahlul Bayt tried to put, put in each and every one of us. Because someone might come forth and say that I take care of my parents. Many people come forth and state, I take great care of my parents. The analogy is what? You can never take the same care towards your parents as your parents took care of you. Why? He says, when your parents are taking care of you, when your mother and your father spend sleepless nights and await to your sleeping and relaxed, when they do not eat until you are fed, when they do not quench their thirst until you and your thirst are quenched. He says, when they take care of you, they think to themselves, my son, my daughter, they shall grow, and they shall be married, and they shall achieve great things, they shall study. They will have religion at their fingertips. 
they look towards the future and say, I will give my son or my daughter the best of life and the best of what I can offer. Whereas when you take care of your parents, brothers and sisters, he says, you look at it in the perspective that they may have a few years left and you take care of them for that particular period. Not knowing when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take his trust on her. You take care of them based on that mentality. That's the difference of opinion when they take care of us and when we take care of our parents, brothers and sisters. And it's unimaginably unparalleled to one another. So you can never begin to imagine the ideal nature of what a parent had to go through. Now karma plays a great role in this, brothers and sisters. And there are many analogies that can take place. When you do something towards your father, do not be surprised if your son does the same to you. As a famous narration, in the time of Arabia, a son took his father after an old age. He could not control himself, he could not take care of his father anymore. He reached a stage where he was unbearable. So the son takes his father and he goes in the deserts. He finds a palm tree. And he lets his father go there. Then his father starts smiling. <coughs> and then he laughs. He begins to laugh. And the son's thinking to himself, my, my father's he's lost it. So he says, Father, where, what is it? What's wrong? Why are you smiling? He says, you would not believe it if I said. He says, you know, tell me. He says, you see this tree? He says, yes. He says, I put my father on the same tree before you. Do not be surprised if what you do, any act that you do behind your father's back, that your son won't do behind your back. Do not be surprised. If you raise your voice on your father, one day your son will raise his voice on you. Do not be surprised. If your ill manners towards your father, you will see in your son in the future years. What goes around, comes around. That's the analogy that takes place, brothers and sisters. What you teach your children plays a vital role. So make sure when you look at Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's letter to his son, Imam Hassan ibn Ali, letter 31 Najid Balagha, let's put it into our own lives, let's cultivate the hearts of our youth before they harden, with the love of Ahlul Bayt, with the mannerisms, with the akhlaq, with the teachings with the ideologies that Imam Hussein stood for. The father-son relationship, you look at the father and you see, as they say, this young lion is from the great lion. You find that Ali al-Akbar from Imam Hussein and the narration stating that a man came to Imam Hussein alayhi salam in the mosque and he says, I saw the Prophet of Allah in my dream last night. He says, I'd love to see him again. Can you show me? Or can you tell me of a way where I can see the Prophet of Islam? He says, not a problem. He says, give me a second. So he calls his son, he says, Oh Ali, Akbili He says, come to me Ali. And he sees as soon as that man saw Ali, Ali in Akbar's face, he fainted. And then he awoke. He says, I could have sworn I saw the Prophet of Islam. He says, such is Ali in Akbar. He says, there was, not, there was not a closer man in his beauty or his akhlaq or the way he acted like Ali in Akbar to the Prophet of Islam. He says, whenever we wanted to look at the Prophet, or remember the Prophet, we'd look at Ali al-Akbar. We'd look at Ali al-Akbar. When Imam Hussein has such a relation with his father, he said, if I have a thousand sons, 
I would call them all Ali. I would call them all Ali. Look at the relation that Imam Hussein had with Imam Ali. And we look at the sons and what they learn from their fathers as an analogy to what we should teach our sons in mannerisms and morals. When Imam Zain al Abidin is being oppressed in the governorship of Hisham ibn Ismail. Hisham, after being taken away from governor, he was tied, tied in the streets of Mecca. And then he was told that anyone that this person is owing anything or he has oppressed anyone, come take your vengeance. Come take your vengeance. Now we look at that Hisham, Hisham ibn Ismail and ask him, what did Hisham say? He says, I am not afraid. I am not afraid of anyone as much as I am afraid of Ali, son of Hussein. Imagine what kind of torture he tortured Ali, Zayn al Abidin, and his family at the Kabbalah. If someone was to come forth as a governor and say, I fear no one as much as Ali ibn al Hussein, imagine what kind of oppression he showed Ali. Now one of Ali Zain al-Abidin's men hears this and he goes to him. He says, Imam, this is your time. Allah has put him in a state where you can take your vengeance. He says, no. He says, come with me. Now look at the beauty of what Imam Hussein taught Imam Zain al-Abidin. He goes to Hisham ibn Ismail and he tells him, he says, Hisham, you can imagine Hisham before the Imam came, what kind of state he was in when the Hisham, when the Imam was coming to him. And as he's afraid, he comes and he leans over. He says, Hisham, he says, if you have any outstanding debts, we, the Ahlul Bayt, will pay them for you. If you are hungry, we shall feed you the best of food. If you are thirsty, we will quench your thirst. If your family is in need of shelter, we will shelter them. That's the Akhlaq of the Ahlul Bayt. Zayn al Abidin was known as one of the Bakkaun. The weepers, and the weepers are five brothers and sisters. Are them first and foremost crying after he left paradise. Nabi Allah Nuh cried, and it's in his name. He says, thirdly, we find who cried? Fatima Tizahra. Fatima Tizahra. We look at Ayyub crying upon Yusuf and Imam Zain al Abidi. Imam Zain al Abidin, when he's asked, he's asked, why do you cry so much of son of Rasulullah? Why is it that you cry so much? He says, I tell you, when Yusuf left his father, he cried three times. Every time he would lose his eyesight and he would cry again. And he would lose his eyesight and he would cry again. And he'd lose his eyesight for a third time. Allah would restore it and he would cry again. Knowing very well that his son was only a couple of kilometers away. He says, you tell me why I cry when I see my father's head. When I see my father being head beheaded on the 10th of Muharram. Imam Zayn al Abidin narrates. He says, it came to a stage on the tent of Muharram where the people would look at one another because the earth trembled. They would look at one another and they would look at Imam Hussein when Shimr ibn al Joshan sat on the chest of Afra Abdullah. And Imam Hussein was hitting the ground and he was hitting the ground and hitting the ground. And they asked Zain Abidin, they said, Zain Abidin, why is it that your father hits the ground? He says, because the earth was about to engulf Shimur ibn al Joshan, he was telling it, stand firm. 
stand firm. That's what kind of an event that the event of Karbala was. That in narrations, this, this, the skies wept blood. And this is not in our narrations, brothers and sisters. This is the narrations of the other schools of thought. It said that the skies wept blood on the tenth of Muhammad. When you see a person that is the closest thing you have to the image of Rasulullah, when he is martyred, and he knew very well who his father and who his grandfather was. When he went on the battlefield, he said, I am Ali, son of Hussein, son of Ali. That's the difference. That's the difference, brothers and sisters. And when we find that Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Safin, he tells Muhammad, he tells Muhammad ibn Hanafi, he says, go. He says, go and go through these ranks and get us to the water. He goes and he comes back. He says, what is the matter? He says, I can't be struck my heart as I saw the arrows coming down like rain. He says, Hassan, you go. And Imam Hassan goes and he brings victory. He brings the water towards Ali's army. He says, look, that's the difference between the son. That's the difference between the sons of Ali and Fatima Mah and the rest of the sons. He says, there is no fear in the hearts of these men. There is no fear, brothers and sisters, when Ali ibn al Hussein went on that battlefield. But look at the relation between a father and son. He says, the happiest time in a man's life, the happiest time, is when a father looks at his newborn child. The happiest moment. He says, and do you know the most devastating moment in a father's life? The most devastating moment in a father's life is when he stands on the corpse of his son. When Imam Hussein alayhi salam saw his son, Ali al-Akbar, die on the battlefield. Sayyidah Zainab narrates, she says, I saw Abba Abdullah walk out, go right and go left. And he would walk in the opposite direction of Ali al-Akbar. He would walk in the opposite direction with his back arched and he would fall and he would get up again and he would fall and he would get up again. And Sayyidah Zainab asked him, he says, Oh Hussein! He says, Oh Hussein, Ali al Akbar is in the other direction. <laughs> Ali al Akbar is in the other direction. He says, La tell me, Zainab. He says, I do not see with my eyes anymore. I do not see with my eyes. And he walks to Ali al Akbar, narration tells us he could not lift him. That's how much strength it took out of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He goes to his son Ali al Akbar and he lays down on the sands of Karbala alongside Ali. And he rubs the blood off his face and he says, Ala dunya ba'daka al Afar. Ala dunya ba'daka al Afar. The very embodiment of the Prophet of Islam lay on the sands of Karbala. Allah lahnat Allah ala qawm al-zalim. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un. Wa sayahlamu al-lazina zalamu al-Muhammad ahayimu qalabiyya qalabiyya wa al-aqibati al-muhtafi. We pray to Allah, brothers and sisters, that our respect for our fathers increases. That our relationship strengthen with our fathers, brothers and sisters. We pray that we go in the footsteps of Ali al-Akbar. We follow the footsteps of Imam Hussein. We follow the footsteps of what happened on the 10th of Muharram. And we learn from the relationships that took place, brothers and sisters.
Because not only people may come forth and say, that's my father. I do not have a good relationship. I want everyone that's father is still alive and does not have the best of relations. Remember, there is one day that shall come that you will be dying to know the fragrance of your father and what it smells like. For those of you who've lost their fathers, know they, they know what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters. Use the time you have on this earth wisely. If you have your father, if your father is still in health, be kind to him, brothers and sisters, because remember your sons will do the same to you. And remember your actions if your fathers are deceased. We send the mercy to our fathers. Do not forget them in your prayers. Do not forget them when you are reciting the Quran. Everything you do, you must remember that it affects them in their grave, brothers and sisters. If you are good, they shall feel mercy in the grave. If you do an action which is bad, Allah will punish them in the grave because they did not praise you. Remember, everything is in relation to your fathers, brothers and sisters. Remember that. We end on that note. And we pray to Allah that we may learn from tonight from the examples of Ali al Akbar and Imam Hussein, brothers and sisters. We pray to Allah that He resurrects us amongst Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We pray to Allah that He resurrects, resurrects us as the Shia of Ali. And we pray to Allah that He resurrects us and puts us as one of the soldiers of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, we pray to Allah with a Fatiha. But before it, three of you allowed the Salawat, Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wow.